President Biden is sending out solicitations to Saudi Arabia and to your Venezuela. Should he be doing that? Well, I think that uh, for Saudi Arabia, definitely uh, it can be a game changer. The world is now uh, for, um, concerned about not only uh, uh, energy security, but also energy affordability. Uh, the world wants to reduce uh, Russian oil production. Uh, it would be good to have OPEC guarantee uh, sufficient supply. So I think, you know, Russia joined OPEC in a structure called OPEC Plus in December 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to get OPEC away from Russia. And one way to do it is to tell OPEC, look, uh, we are going to restrict Russia's access to oil technology. We're going to restrict Russia's access to international financial markets. We're going to restrict Russia's access to uh, oil, oil markets. So we're going to make sure that Russia's uh, market share in oil shrinks. But help us do it in a responsible way by you taking up the slack uh, to keep prices relatively stable. So I think it's strategic uh, to redefine the relationship with, with OPEC. I think Venezuela is not a player. Venezuela is not producing oil because they have destroyed the whole ecosystem to, to produce oil. And, uh, you know, a little change here or there is not going to change the picture in Venezuela and it's not going to change the picture of the oil market. But to Tom's point here, it's a little bit out of the fire and into the frying pan or out of the frying frying pan and into the fire when it comes to uh, needing oil that much more and setting prices up. Is there a more effective way for the West to go about this to hurt Russia more than Russia is hurting the West? Absolutely. Uh, you see, if you embargo Russia's oil and, and it cannot come out, then Russian oil production is going to come down. Uh, world prices are going to go up. Uh, the oil producers become richer and the oil consumers become poorer. And so it's a very expensive policy uh, for, say, Europe. If you want a policy that gets right, what you want really is to get Russia's oil, but for Putin not to get the money. And the way to do that is you just tax uh, the oil. Since Russian oil has to compete with Saudi oil or with, uh, you know, um, Emirati oil, uh, it will have to be more or less the same price, right? Except that one pays the tax. So uh, for Russia, they would have to put a discount so large. He sounds like that a this... Trump advisor. <laughs> well, I mean, this is the issue, right? That a lot of people are opposed to this. Why hasn't why this, not... yeah, yeah. Yeah. Why hasn't this well, been more Well, no, Secretary Yellen came out, came out in favor of it. And she said that she was going to propose it at the G7 meeting. So it makes all the sense in the world. Because right. if you are only taxing Russian oil, you're not taxing all oil. So Russian oil with the tax will have to compete with the mm -hmm. rest of the oil. So a Russian oil after tax, the, the amount of money that Putin gets, is going to go down. And that's something that can be done now. Weaning Europe mm -hmm. out of oil is going to take months or years. Uh, but the war is now. You want to harm Russia now, not in a, in a few months or in a few years. So it's just smart. In, in that world, Russian oil still comes out, so world oil prices don't go up, but the cash flow of Russia is hurt. So I think it's just a smarter right, way to wage this war. You own the high yeah. ground with Barry Eichengreen of thinking about how emerging markets can respond in financial markets and also within trade flows in real economies as well. Should we be afraid now of emerging market fragilities given a pandemic? given a war in Ukraine, and maybe also given big economy irresponsibility. How fragile are they? Well, I think that it's a mixed bag. So we can talk about individual countries. But in general, in, in the emerging markets, there is a lot of commodity exporters for which the current situation is a positive shock. Uh, you know, they are either exporting oil or minerals or agricultural products, and all of those are, uh, have gone up in price, and, and that's generating a more income for the country as a whole. In a country, say, like, uh, like South Africa, um, you know, the net effect on, on the country is positive, but it's super positive on the government mm -hmm. and negative on households. So you have a, 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 a domestic problem of how do you do, mm -hmm. you know, what does the government do with its, uh, with its unexpected right. extra income, and, and how do you cushion the blow on households? Because energy right. prices are up and food prices are up, 
Uh, they are producers of food and they are producers of energy, but still their prices are I've up. got to squeeze this in. In the greater Car Caribbean, how do we promote democracy? You have been doing this for decades. Cuba, the Castro regime moves on to something new and different. The mess in your Venezuela. How do we promote democracy within the greater Monroe Doctrine? Well, I think uh, you know. First of all, it's not a it's not a short fight. It's a fight. Uh, you know, uh, these countries are supported by the likes of Putin and uh, uh, and you know. So so you know, winning in Ukraine uh, is going to to the extent that it harms uh, Russia. It's going to harm Venezuela. Venezuelan dictatorship and the Cuban dictatorship and the Nicaraguan dictatorship. So I think uh, it's just a long haul and we have to keep right. at it until, until you know, well, we get to reestablish democracy. And that's what Elliot Cohen said in his article on statecraft and foreign affairs. We've got to get at, got to it, make it for the long haul and keep at it.